my name is Jeff Shaner, and I'm the product manager for uh, Collector for ArcGIS, as well as some of our other mobile products. And joined with me today is Doug Morgenthaler. He's the product owner for Collector. Uh, and together we wanted to give you an introduction and overview of Collector, talk about uh, some of the deployments, show you some demonstrations as well. But I wanted to ask before we begin, how many of you here today are using Collector for ArcGIS? Okay, for those of you that aren't, how many are planning to deploy it by the end of this year? Quite a few. If there's anyone remaining there, um, is this just uh, your first uh, sense into mobile? You haven't done anything mobile? A couple of you, okay. Well, by the time we leave today, you're gonna be out there using mobile. Um, one of the things to note, actually, about uh, for those that have never used a collector, you can download it from the store. So if you're on an iPhone or an Android device, um, you could download it from the store today and without even setting up an ArcGIS Online uh, account or named users, you can tap the Try It Live and you can play around with it right here and now uh, because we have a bunch of sample maps there. So if you get bored with me droning on and with my monotone voice this morning, just play around with the collector and you'll become an expert. <coughs> What I wanted to do though was start a little bit by talking on our strategy around mobile. Um, were all of you here for the plenary? Hands up for the plenary? Quite a few of you. Uh, we told a story around what we call apps for the field. And this is really important to where we're going with our mobile applications as part of the development work we do in, in Esri. Um, and it starts in the desktop with planning actually. <laughs> Um, so you need to think about how do you deploy your mobile workforce uh, and that starts with you as GIS professionals uh, not only just authoring maps and uh, sharing them for use with the collector application uh, inside of your ArcGIS organization but um, right to the very beginnings with planning and how you would manage your uh, work assignments and the optimization of the field work that you need to do. And we are providing with all of our applications a set of scripts and uh, documentation around best practices for, for that kind of planning work. Um, but we're thinking about the whole life cycle of uh, mobile deployments. And that not just means planning, but coordination. How do I communicate between the office and the field, or when I'm in the field, between uh, mobile workers themselves? So uh, one of the applications that we've been building around that that's going to release next week is called Workforce for ArcGIS and following this session I'll be booking it down to the far end of the convention center to present on that. Um, so if you're interested in it and haven't looked at it. Uh, Navigate is really about getting to the location of your field work and uh, I think most of you should have seen a demonstration of uh, Navigator for ArcGIS and what's really exciting for us about Navigator is that it's not like a consumer um, navigation app. You could use Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever it might be, but with Navigator, you as GIS professionals are building the maps that are inside of it. So that could just be simply overlaying uh, your own asset layers on top of it and being able to search against that as uh, destinations, or it could be infusing in your own um, roads, your own custom private roads or uh, new, new development roads into our existing street map data and using it for navigation purposes. So Navigator is very powerful um, and uh, it fits right into the apps that we're building. Uh, obviously with data capture we have a collector for ArcGIS which you're all here to, to learn about. And we also have Survey123 which is a form centric um, mobile application that you can use to capture data as well. And all through that process you can monitor the operations that are going on in the field uh, both with the content that gets created and your mobile workers using um, our apps like uh, Operations Dashboard for ArcGIS as well. So we're thinking about how have all these apps work together and on the mobile device how they can call and remotely work with one another too as part of a suite of apps. So either they could work independently or they could work together. And the real strength is when they're working together. Uh, so that's my little spiel on the overall um, strategy. And we'll be building more and more capabilities into each of those apps and how they work and talk to one another as we move forward. 
But let's focus in on Collector. So Collector is a map-centric uh, field data collection app. Uh, and it's built upon the foundation of using the ArcGIS platform. So the maps that you author uh, inside of desktop um, are published up as services and exposed through web maps inside of your ArcGIS organization. And all that intelligence you put into the design of the map and the geodatabase comes through in the user experience of Collector. So Collector is a generic field data collection app, but it becomes very focused when you're designing an effective map. And Doug's going to show you some examples of that. Um, Collector works offline. So what's really important for a lot of you, how many people need to work offline where there's no internet connectivity? Yeah, despite where we see everybody texting and on their phones, getting a data connection is tough. And doing data collection um, out in the field requires that you be able to work completely disconnected from the internet. Uh, and Collector can do that. It can actually work either in a connected sense or a disconnected <coughs> sense. And we've built it for the iOS platform, for the Android platform, and also um, late last year we released it for the Windows 10 tablets. Anybody here use Windows 10? Or planning to use Windows 10? All right, a few of you. Microsoft really screwed that one up, I tell you. Um, hopefully there's someone from Microsoft in the room. So just looking at some of the um, ways people are using Collector today. Uh, some of the, the things we've seen from, from our customers is uh, a big use is collecting uh, an asset inventory. Actually, or going out and ground truthing the data that you already have. And one of the strengths of Collector is being able to see that, uh, that GIS feature on the map if it exists capture photos of it, maybe correct its location if you'd like, uh, or capture new locations. Or if you're doing maintenance work, being able to model um, inspections using related tables within Collector. So a lot of uh, different types of use cases. I want to touch on a couple of them um, as they're, I think they're really important for us in our direction moving forward with Collector. This is a, um, a story that it, there's a blog article for uh, we put together a couple of weeks ago where uh, this is a, a person named Travis Anderson and he's out of uh, Leax Water District. Uh, and what he's doing here is he's got his um, iPad mounted to that pole. He's using an EOS um, Aero GNSS receiver with an antenna on top of the pole. Uh, and he's connected to the Ohio uh, DOT's um, RTK network. And he's marking that hydrant location within two centimeters. So that's something you can now do with Collector. Uh, we have it in beta. We're going to show you that demo right at the very end. But really important to that strategy around asset inventory is being able to um, capture data with an ensured spatial accuracy. And we've been all over that, building new functionality into Collector that we're going to release in a few weeks. Here's another interesting use case. If you were in the plenary, you might have seen an imagery demo that showed uh, the LA Coliseum. So USC approached us, uh, it was actually a little over a week ago, believe it or not, um, saying, hey, we've got this uh, new NFL team called the Rams. Uh, they got to play here for a couple of years till we get a new stadium built, but we don't have any data. And uh, LAPD is on our case, the state's on our case. For emergency management purposes, we need a map, and we need a map quickly, and it needs to be accurate. So what we did is we uh, partnered up with 3DR. Uh, we went out and we, um, I actually took my son's soccer cones, and we marked locations on the field. Then we went out into the stands. You can see it in that far right picture. We used Collector with um, uh, Trimble R2 receiver with RTX um, satellite-based corrections. Uh, got accuracy within uh, 20 centimeters, both horizontal and vertical. A drone flew over it. We used the locations that we mapped and uh, rubber sheeted the imagery and had a 3D mesh and um, and 2D uh, high quality imagery accurate to one inch. And you know what? We started at 8 o'clock in the morning. We even had it processed by noon. So thinking about that, you can combine 
um, like drone to map and collector together to do rapid, uh, rapid data collection. And we're seeing more and more of that coming from our customers. And then if you didn't see this at the end of the plenary, it was a real shame. And, and we have to, to take advantage of this and say collector is so easy that a dog can use it. <laughs> right? So um, in this instance, there's multiple uses of collector, right? Um, if you remember the story, um, the, the, the Kalmar Museum is doing an archaeological dig. I'll just kind of briefly summarize. And uh, Fables, uh, or Fable, I think is the proper way to pronounce uh, his name, uh, is uh, actually a cadaver dog. But the cadavers he's looking for, which I don't quite understand, are over 4,000 years old. Uh, but he's able to sniff out locations, and he's using the location tracking capabilities inside of Collector and just running around. And they're using his spots and where he stops to uh, do analysis and, uh, and then uh, do further, further digging and whatnot. And they're also using the Leica Xeno 20 on a pole uh, when they're at a specific location to also identify remains or artifacts that they found. So very different types of applications of the collector application that I wanted to share with you. But best to see it in action, so I'm going to pass it over to Doug, who's going to walk you through that overall step of starting with nothing and actually creating and using collector. All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, so let me switch over here. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that you need to do to get started with Collector. And the first is really authoring a map to be used in Collector. And Collector, like the, Arc the rest of the ArcGIS platform, uses web maps and feature layers. So we're going to go through the process quickly of how you can get started either in ArcGIS Online or in Portal for ArcGIS uh, to get those things created up and, and up and running quickly so that you can get out to the field with Collector. So the first thing we're going to do, uh, I'm here, I'm in, I'm in ArcGIS Online at the moment, is I want to go ahead and create a feature layer. Now, we have a series of predefined templates that people use for data collection. So you can see that we've got uh, examples here for bridge inventory, for uh, field uh, notes, for boom placement, my resolution's not happy with this. Um, but we also have uh, field notes. So if I do field, um, you can see that I've got field notes here. Well, you can't really because you, I can't read it. Uh, but I know the photo well enough. Uh, so you, we have these. They're predefined. They're based on uh, the work that we do with our industry teams and our solution teams. So these are vetted um, and really reflect the best, uh, best practices for each one of these sort of in uh, these sort of areas. So I'm going to go ahead and create uh, this field notes service uh, in the layer. And within this layer, I have points, lines, and polygons. One of the things that um, we don't often show but is very important is that collector can be used to collect not just points but lines and polygons as well. All right, we'll go ahead and continue on. And then I can just specify the area in which I'll be working, uh, which I'll say somewhere in the San Diego area here. And then I need to enter a title. And we'll go ahead and, and complete that. Now, so what's happening is it's creating a hosted feature service for us in, in ArcGIS Online or in Portal, if that's what you're using. Um, and this is what we need in order to start our data collection efforts. So Collector requires uh, a map that contains an editable feature service. Um, so now we're going to, we've got our, our feature layer here, and we're going to go ahead and just add that to a new map. All right, so there we go. So there's our, there's our three layers. Um, of course, authoring a web app is something that most of you are very familiar with. You want to think about you know, how you can make your web map uh, and, the, and the information in your map as easy to use for your field workforce as possible. So things like setting up bookmarks. Um, so if we wanted to zoom in to the uh, convention center here, I could add a bookmark. 
Um, I can also, of course, set the base map. So one of my field workers, if they, they prefer to use the streets base map rather than the topo base map or one of your own custom base maps, uh, you could certainly do that. And the other things that you really want to think about are uh, setting up the symbology. So we have a number of demo theaters this week uh, talking about how you can create symbology that's easy to visualize and tap on in the field. Um, so you want to think about things like that. The other thing is the pop-up. Um, again, when you're out in the field, it's hot, it's you know, humid, at least in a lot of places. Um, and you know, they have a lot of work to do. So you want to optimize that. It, it, and that serves two purposes, really. It's the opportunity for you to help them be more efficient. It also helps uh, minimize the amount of uh, data that they actually have to put in or, or look at when they're working. So I'm not going to make any changes there. So I'm going to go ahead and save my map now. Give it a name here. Add a tag. Uh, and a description if I so desired. And I'll save that. Now, the, the last thing I need to do, I've, I've, so I've created a, a feature layer in which I want to collect my information into. I've saved my, created and added that and saved my web map. Now I need to share that web map with users that are going to be out in the field. So uh, typically that's going to be done through groups, uh, much, like, much like we do for other content. Um, it's also telling me, of course, that uh, I need to update the sharing for the layer that I created to make sure it's also available to that group. And we'll go ahead and complete that work. So just in a, in a couple of minutes, we started with you know, nothing, and created a feature layer we can use for data collection, added that to the web map, and now we're ready to go out and use Collector in the field. All right, so I'm going to switch over to the iPad here. And we're going to go out and just do some, uh, some simple data collection. So I've got a list of maps here. I've signed in to my ArcGIS organizational account. And I have a series of maps that are available to me. So you can see here on the right-hand side, I have Field Notes UC2. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and tap on that to open it. And just to be clear, I am working in an online mode at this case. So Collector can work online and offline. All right, so we're, we're here in uh, the map. So on the right-hand side here, you'll see a list of feature types. So these are the feature types that those layer are present in those layers that I can use to start collecting data in. So you can see that I've got a handful. And these are very generic, but you could um, imagine that I, I, could, I could have renamed these. I could have removed some of these um, and, and, and customized that beyond what came out in the template initially. So um, again, to get started collecting a point, all I need to do is tap on the type of feature that I want to collect. and it's going to use my location. Uh, you can see that it's dropped a point there uh, right underneath my, my GPS location. So by default, it's going to use my GPS location if it's accurate enough, um, which on Wi-Fi in here is, is not good. So I've set my, my accuracy up quite a bit. Um, and then from there, I can, of course, if I wanted to uh, refine that location, I could uh, also tap on the map to set the location. Um, and if, you know, if, as my position was getting better, um, I could tap on the current location button here at the top and reuse my GPS location. So once I've set my geometry uh, for, for the point that I'm collecting, I can just start entering information here. So if I say, uh, let's just say hydrant. Uh, we do make use of pick lists. Uh, so again, minimizing the amount of information that people have to actually type in on a field on a mobile device, uh, also minimize the accuracy or the errors that might be introduced by people doing that incorrectly. You can use uh, some of these types. Um, in addition, date pickers um, as well. So obviously, in many cases, you you will want to record that as well. We do make use of the date picker. Um, <clears throat> and finally, once I'm done, uh, I can just hit submit. and send that edit to my feature layer. What's really great about that is working in the online mode, that feature is now immediately available to 
anybody in my organization who's looking at that. So if they're using, uh, looking at what information is coming in from the field in a, up in a dashboard or in a web app, a story map, um, that is always going to be available to you. So very easy to go through and, and do some data collection and make that available to the rest of the organization very quickly. Uh, the last thing I want to I want to highlight is um, the ability to collect lines. So we talked about lines and polygons also being something you can collect. Uh, when you're collecting uh, lines or polygons, you can do that in a couple of different ways. So you can set up uh, and start streaming. And streaming essentially drops a point at a specified interval. So one second, five seconds, whatever sort of makes sense for you. Um, as you walk along the path, it's going to collect that automatically. Uh, you can also, of course, just move along and at each point that you want to collect, you can just tap on the current location. So if I start here, and I'll just start by tapping on the, a couple of points on the map, but I can also use my GPS location to set that, uh, th that location as well. Uh, photos, uh, photo attachments are something that many of you do uh, with Collector. So you can come in and simply add a photo to any, any feature that has attachments enabled uh, for that layer. And you can do that either by taking a photo uh, directly from the device or choosing one from the library. Let's go for the uh, world panda. And then again, we'll go ahead and submit that. So, just a quick overview of, of how you can do data collection uh, with Collector. Now, a couple of other things that I just wanted to highlight. Um, you can use uh, other tools that are available. So, for example, if I'm, if I'm interested in measuring a distance, um, I can, of course, use my GPS to do this measurement. But I, it, obviously, I'm standing here. It's not going to be very interesting. Um, but I can do that also within Collector, so if I, if I'm, if I need that information available to me. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, we have other tools like bookmarks so you can see that we can zoom in to the convention center, that bookmark that I authored in the web map. Okay, um, so with that, I think we'll turn it back okay. to Jeff. Just uh, over to one. Thanks, Doug. So just recapping on a few of the things that Doug was just showing you and, and, uh, and giving a bit additional context, Collector is an app. Oh, sorry, yes, I'll take that question. Ah, the question is, do photos take up a lot of your credits? Um, if you're using photos that are large in size, they can consume credits. Um, we don't charge you feature storage uh, for attachments. They're considered file storage, which is a reduced cost. Uh, but it's really going to determine how, much, uh, how many photos you have and how large that database gets. Um, Yes, you can download the attachments. It's a, it's a type within um, the geodatabase information model. So you can download the features as a file geodatabase, and the attachments will come with it. And then you can pull the attachments out. And there's Python scripts to help automate that as well. But by default, they're stored uh, within the database. But like I said, we don't charge you feature storage. We charge you file storage. If you're using hosted services, and we do have settings to optimize the size of the photo uh, as well. So we'll show you that in a little bit, too. Um, I did want to mention uh, that Collector itself is an app that you get with the ArcGIS platform. You don't pay extra for the app. But it does require that each individual field worker has their own named user, their own identity. And that's important uh, not just from us because it's free and we got to justify our existence within Esri building apps, uh, but also because we use that identity. Uh, we use it uh, when you're editing. So uh, that identity could come uh, as an ArcGIS Online identity. It could come as an enterprise identity, like within your Active Directory. With Portal, you can use a XAML provider. Um, and uh, that could be from any, any source. And we can support multi-factor th multi authentication. But important to that identity is that when you use a feature called editor tracking, we'll automatically um, add the user's identity into the feature, as well as date timestamp it. Uh, and you don't have to manage those as attributes that you enter separately. Um, as, Doug, as Doug showed you, it's all centered on the, on the web map. 
So the amount of time you invest in the web map uh, is how great your collector experience is going to be. Um, and those maps can be created inside of ArcGIS Online or Portal. And we see a lot of customers that use a hybrid approach where you have services coming from your own ArcGIS server instance, not necessarily just from a hosted feature service, and the web maps inside of ArcGIS Online. Um, and as we're going to show in a later demo, you can download and work offline inside of Collector. Wow, that looks really washed really out. Washed out. Um, really important uh, in the Collector experience is that there's a map that's editable. So as Doug showed you, he created a feature layer. And the feature service is what we use to synchronize data between the device and the server. Uh, whether that server's hosted in the cloud or it's behind your firewall, it's a feature service that uh, provides that capability. And it needs to be editable in order for Collector to be able to view that map as a list in the list of maps and for you to be able to work with it and use it. Um, there is a concept of a location tracking layer. That's the one that Fable was using. Uh, and you can add that in to your web map. And so as you're out doing data collection with the application, it can log a breadcrumb trail of where, where you've been as you're collecting data. Uh, also important in the concept of the map is the base map. And uh, we won't really talk about it much here, but uh, you can optimize your offline use of Collector by actually creating your own base map. And you can sideload or copy it to your device. And that format is called a tile package. Uh, and you can create it directly in ArcMap if you have your own um, imagery or base map that you want to take offline. And it can be extremely large. If you think about downloading from our Esri base maps, well, we actually uh, put a little governor on there so that it can only go to 100,000 tiles, which equates to around uh, one and a half to two gigabytes in size. But if you cook your own tile package with ArcMap, we've seen them up to 16, 18 gigabytes and, and more in size that then get copied to the device. They can be an extremely large extent. Um, and then you're just taking offline in the collector app the features in the feature layers. And of course, you've got to share those maps in groups. That's the way that the named users inside of your organization get access to them. Uh, as far as the feature layers themselves, um, like we already talked about, they could either be hosted inside of ArcGIS Online or they can be from your on-premise uh, ArcGIS server or hosted in your portal. There's a hosting concept in portal as well, I should have mentioned. Um, we support the uh, different operations on that feature service, like the editing option. So you could actually turn a service where you want people to be able to um, update the attributes of the features uh, within a layer, but not be able to create new features in that layer. Those kind of editing options are available on the feature service, as well as some sync capabilities. And as Doug showed you, the pop-ups and the fields that you author in your feature layers are really important because they drive that edit editing experience, like the pick lists or the date uh, pickers or whatever it might be. The range domains, those are all enforced um, uh, in Collector, but you need to set them up inside of um, the maps that you create. And really, those templates that you might be familiar with inside of ArcMap, that's your data dictionary as you're using the mobile application. So it really defines the object that you're creating in the field. So if you name it uh, properly, then that really guides your field worker into the type of thing that they're, they're going to create. But if it's point as a name, they're going to not really understand that too much. And as Doug showed you, you can jumpstart your work using the templates. There's the ones that are embedded into, inside of ArcGIS Online. But also, uh, our solutions team manages um, their own site. Uh, and if you go to solutions.arcgis.com, uh, you'll find a gallery there where you can filter on collector. And there's over 60 different collector templates that uh, you can access and start to use. So um, I recommend that. Uh, you start looking at these data models first because um, they can really help you get started with Collector quickly. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Doug, who's going to show you more about the offline capabilities. All right. OK. So here we are. We're back on, on, on the iPad. Um, and we want to talk about how you work with Collector offline. So. 
there are a couple things that you need to have uh, in order for your map to be able to be taken offline. One is that the base map that you're using um, will need to be, uh, you can export the, the data, the tiles, and take them offline. You'll also need your feature layers and the feature service to have that sync capability enabled. Um, so you can see that uh, some of these have the cloud with the down arrow. So those are the ones that I can take offline. So I'm going to uh, go through a, an inspection workflow. So we, that initial demo we talked about was more about just going out and collecting new data. Um, but many of you probably have to go out and inspect your existing assets on a regular basis. So we'll kind of walk through that uh, here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the San Diego Hydrant Inspections map here on the, on the upper right. And I'm just going to tap the down arrow. And that's going to ask me whether or not if I have any existing base maps on the device, um, whether or not I want to use that. So I may need to download two or three maps, but I don't necessarily want to download two or three base maps. If I'm working in the same area, I can reuse that base map. So that's, that's one thing that you can do. Um, the other thing, is, of course, is you can define the, the area um, and uh, the base map that you want to take offline, which is what we'll do here. So as Jeff mentioned, we do have uh, some restrictions on how much data you can take offline for our servers. Um, but I, essentially what I need to do is I need to define the area, the work area that I'm going to take offline. That's going to determine the tiles that we, the base map that we take offline, the size and the space of the base map, the extent. Uh, it's also going to determine the features that we take offline. We don't necessarily want to take offline all of the data that's, that's in your services. Um, we just really want to take off the data that we're going to be working with. So I'm going to zoom in here. Um, and we're going to go to a pretty small area because my Wi-Fi is not, not ideal today. Um, and then the other thing that I need to do is uh, set the detail of the map. So this is really about the detail of the base map. So what I need to do here is you know, figure out what level of detail do I need? Do I just need reference data, like just to sort of get to a, you know, get me to a, you know, orient myself? Uh, or am I actually using that to help facilitate my data collection? So I want, like, for example, imagery. Like I might actually want to you know, look at the imagery as well as my points that I'm collecting um, or inspecting. So and you'll see as I, as I make changes here that the estimated size for that download uh, changes. So, you know, and again, that's just the with more levels of detail, the more data you're going to take off. So I'm going to keep this one pretty small, uh, just in the interest of time. We'll go ahead and start that download. So what that's doing is it's going out and it's uh, taking that base map, which is the topo base map in our, in our case here, and it's taking off those tiles and those tile layers, uh, the scales that I specified, Putting, bringing that down to the device. And it's also taking all of the features that were within that work area, taking those and also storing those on the device. So once this is done, I'll be able to com completely work disconnected. Or even, you know, this is also valuable if you're going to be working in, in an occasionally connected environment. So sometimes you may have some coverage, but it's either poor or spotty. Um, this is really something that you can, can use to, uh, to mitigate that. Uh, that connectivity issue. So, okay, so now you can see that I've got a badge there that says that my map has now uh, been downloaded and it's available on my device. Um, I can easily filter this list um, just by tapping the on device uh, tab here, and that gives me just, just the maps that I've downloaded. So we'll go ahead and open this map, and you see that uh, I am going to go in airplane mode so we can actually prove that we're working offline here. Um, you can see that I've just got that area that I took offline. So I've just got the tiles and the, and the features that were in that work area that I specified. Um, and so in this case, I'm doing a hydrant inspection. So as Jeff mentioned, you can control what your field workforce can do. So in this case, I've set the layer in the map to disable editing. So this, so they can't actually touch or edit the, or collect the hydrant features at all. Because all I want uh, my workforce to be doing with this map is doing inspections. And we're going to use, do that with related records. So I'm going to tap on a, on a particular hydrant here. Um, and you'll see that the, uh, 
you'll you have the attributes for the hydrant itself. Um, so I can I can view the information for that hydrant. But you can see down below I have a, a related table um, for my inspections. So I, I can view existing inspections. Um, you can see that there's a couple of inspections here that were done um, on this hydrant already. Um, and I can see that there's information about that, as well as photos that might have been attached uh, as part of that inspection. Um, and I can also, of course, then create a new inspection record. So that's what we're going to do here. So we'll go ahead and tap New. And we can just go ahead and fill out our inspection for this particular hydrant. So was, PSI was 120. Was the and and then of course I, using pick lists I can say you know what maintenance is required, uh, if any. Um, I can say what the date is for the inspection. So we'll go with today, um, and then again I can attach a photo, um, if I if I so desired here, uh, to my inspection, and then I can go ahead and submit that. And what that's doing is it's actually storing those that new. Uh, inspection record on the device. Um, so again, I'm in airplane mode, I'm out in the field, don't have any connectivity right now. So I can work, you know, as long as I need to out in the field. Um, when I am done, uh, I can then come back in the office and you'll see um, I have on my cloud there for, on the map, I have a little red badge that's telling me the number of edits that I have that I haven't yet sent to the server. So I'm going to come out of airplane mode and go back on the Wi-Fi. And at this point, I want to, I'm back in the office. I've got connectivity. I want to push those edits back uh, to the server. So I'm going to just go ahead and tap on the, no, that wasn't what I was going to tap on, uh, on the sync button. And what that's doing is it's sending all of the edits that I had stored locally in my device while I was out. Uh, and it's also pulling any edits that happened in that work area back down to me. So I've now got the latest copy of what's actually on uh, in that area in, the, in my feature layers. So uh, a couple of things to note here. Um, this particular map was set up with uh, a map. My map was stored in ArcGIS Online. Um, but those services were actually hosted on ArcGIS server um, behind my firewall. So, I have access to those services um, that, are, that are using server. I don't have to use hosted services. So many of you may already have ArcGIS server, already have your services. You can absolutely take advantage of those um, immediately just with, uh, without having to push the data up into ArcGIS online. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. We can push it back yeah. over to one. Yeah, so a couple of things to mention off of that demo uh, around the offline use. And I want to touch on what he just said about um, your own ArcGIS server instance. Um, there's really two ways to make that happen with the data behind your firewall. Uh, one of them is that on the device you could uh, establish a VPN connection and that can get you through your firewall from the field um, into the service. And um, you're going to have to talk with your IT folks about being able to, to get VPN access. You're also going to have to talk to them about another approach. And uh, it could be effective if you come in with maybe a dozen donuts and some coffee <laughs> and say, hey, you know, we really got this collector thing going on. Can you poke a hole in the firewall and set up a reverse proxy? And maybe the donuts sliding them in there will make that possible. Um, but that is one of the challenges you face with ArcGIS server uh, and, and access. Another is that you could literally go into the office if you can get Wi-Fi connectivity while you're in the office, download what you need, go out to the field, do your collection work offline, come back in the office and sync. Um, not ideal because you have to come back in the office, but, um, but that's one, one other way. There's one last way, uh, which is one that we don't do much, but we have done with a number of customers, is that if uh, you within your organization have a, a mobile device management software, an MDM, like uh, Mobile Iron or uh, Citrix Zen Mobile, or there's a number of them out there, um, you can work with your account manager to get the binaries of our apps. And what that provides you is the ability to uh, put collector into your own internal app store 
and then uh, infuse um, app-level VPN capabilities into it. Those come with uh, the major uh, MDM uh, providers. And then for the field worker, it's a matter of opening up the collector app and it establishes the VPN connection for, for the user and they don't have to go through a lot of processes. So just another thought to consider there. Uh, the overall flow around um, working with Collector and the offline capabilities is kind of like this. Um, one approach is that you start actually with ArcGIS Desktop authoring maps, right? And you're publishing services to uh, your ArcGIS server or you're publishing them up to um, either Portal or ArcGIS Online in a hosted sense. And then you're preparing the map, and that's the web map that you're creating inside of your ArcGIS organization. And you're sharing that map, um, as we've described and shown, uh, using the concept of groups. That's where multiple users get access to content. Uh, and from there, you can then download maps to the device and um, do your editing, query, viewing, um, that sort of thing, and then synchronize those changes back. Um, when, when you have the opportunity to do so. So that's essentially the flow of Collector uh, in a nutshell. A couple other things that I, I wanted to mention about Collector that we haven't talked about yet is that integration with other apps. We've talked about Navigator, um, and Collector and Navigator work really well together. So within Collector, uh, say you search for a location in your map, and you want to be able to get to that location from your current location, well, uh, you can tap Get Directions to here. And if Navigator's installed on the device, what will happen is that it will remotely call the Navigator application, pass the location that you searched for into it, generate a route from your current position to the location of that feature, and then you can just uh, tap the Start Navigation button and it will navigate you to that location as you're driving or walking or whatever it might be. Um, so it shows that, that real integration with uh, being able to get to the location of the work you need to do and where you need to be able to collect it. Likewise, Collector itself can be remotely called uh, using the workforce for ArcGIS application. So workforce you can think of kind of like the app hub uh, on your mobile device, and uh, it's giving you the work that you need to do inside of Collector. So it's your to-do list, right? And uh, if I have that hydrant inspection that needs to be done, that's a work assignment that appears inside of the Collector application, or sorry, inside of the Workforce application. If I tap on it, I can say Collect here, uh, and it'll open up the Collector application uh, and let you do your data collection work or your inspection work right at that uh, spot. And then you can go back and mark the work assignment as completed and continue on. So workforce is a real complement uh, to your use of Collector, just like Navigator is. We're moving along pretty good here. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is just the latest things that we've released and uh, what's coming next. And we've got some more demos we want to show about that. Pass it back over to you, Doug. Okay, so first thing we want to talk about is how you might be able to optimize your offline workflow with some of the new capabilities that we've made available uh, earlier this year. So this is what I'll be talking about now is really what's already in Collector today that you have in your hands. So uh, just a little bit of context. So this particular map uh, is designed for damage assessment. Um, and you, you'll see that I've got a, a series of grids. These are one by one mile grids um, that oftentimes people will use to delineate where people should go, do damage assessment, how do they prioritize and, and, and manage the work. Um, there's a couple things about this map. So you'll see one, there, there are some features here just north of the convention center um, that have already been collected. Um, the other thing that I wanna point out is this map has been configured to really minimize the amount of traffic that is sent back and forth between the server. So again, a lot of cases, either limited connectivity or you know, poor bandwidth, whatever the case may be, um, especially in you know, disaster response scenarios, you really need to minimize the amount of data that you're pulling back and forth. Um, and for, for this map, really the idea is, is that the 
the people that are going out and doing the damage assessments are really just acting as sensors. They don't care about any data that they have already, has already been collected by somebody else. They're, they have their assigned area. They're going through and they're doing the collection. They see what they're collecting and they don't care about anything else. There are ways now that you can minimize or, or mitigate how much data you have to pull down. So uh, for, if we look at the details for this particular map we, we just saw here, um, and we go to the settings, there are some new capabilities that are available here. One, of course, is, uh, which is, has been there for a while, has been the ability to configure whether or not a map can, uh, can be taken offline. So again, in disaster response scenarios, that's often very important, is to be able to take that map offline. Um, but we also have some new options that allow you to specify how, how and what types of data will be taken offline. Uh, when you download that map and collector. So first thing I can do is I can minimize how much data I'm actually bringing down. So in this case, I don't wanna bring any data down. Again, those disaster response folks really just wanna be going out and collecting new information and all they want is essentially is the schema. They want the schema of that layer available so they can start adding information to it um, and push it back. Um, secondly, I can also limit uh, the amount of, like if I did need data, I could also limit the amount of attachments. Again, attachments, you know, our, our cameras are getting quite good on these smartphones, um, that they can be pretty expensive. If I don't need that information, I can uh, elect to not download that um, when I take that map offline. Um, and then finally, you can, you know, we, you can include data that is really just reference data. So for example, those grids, um, I need to know what grid I'm, I'm in and make sure I understand the boundaries so I'm collecting where I'm supposed to be. Um, but I certainly don't want the field worker editing that. But you can include that data uh, in the map um, and make that data off available offline. Okay, so now we've taken a look at this. Let's go to collector here. Um, and take a look at how this works. So uh, I have a couple of maps here uh, and I have a San Diego damage assessment map. And I'm just gonna go ahead and download this. So if you recall, we had some features north of uh, San Diego, uh, north of the convention center. So the process for, well, actually, I take that back. We're gonna start, we can make this even easier. So one of the things that Jeff mentioned was you can sideload your base map. Again, a lot of the, the traffic, when you're pulling that data down, you may a, want a huge area. Um, and if you're using our base maps, we'll limit you to, to, a, to a 100,000 tiles. Um, but it also takes a lot in terms of bandwidth. Uh, so what I've done already is I've prepared a, a tile package, as Jeff mentioned, um, and I've uh, copied that to my device. And that can be done on iOS through iTunes um, or through the file system on Android or Windows. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and add a base map and make that available. So. I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna say I want to uh, grab this San Diego imagery base map. And I'm just gonna go ahead and make that available. That's gonna go ahead and copy into my device. So you can see here it's copying in and now I have that base map that's available to me. So now when I go and I say I'd like to download um, my map, Again, I have the option now to use the, uh, define the area and take the base map offline, or I can use the one that I just sideloaded onto my device. So you can see that that's 235 megabytes I didn't have to download. And you could make, make this base map available to everyone that's going out and you know, just sideload that and really minimize the, uh, the network traffic. All right, so once I tap on that, the only thing I need to do now, remember before we had to define the work area and the level of detail, now I only need to worry about the work area because I'm only taking my features offline. Um, in this case, I'm not actually gonna take that many features offline either. Um, so i go ahead and define this area. It'll be a pretty large extent. Um, and I'll go ahead and hit download. Now, because of those settings I had configured on the web map, it is only going to download essentially the empty schema. So it's not gonna, if, so I'll be able to collect information for that feature layer, but I won't get any of those features that we saw north of the convention center. 
So this will really speed up the, the download process and make this, make this really ready to, to get going with, uh, with a minimal amount of work um, to get people out in the field. All right, so now we'll, we'll just take a look. And you can see here, North Lake Convention Center, those features were not downloaded. So again, I didn't have to use any data or pull any data down that I didn't need. Um, but now I'm immediately available, of course, to start doing data collection just like I, I did before. Um, a couple of other points to note. Um, we do support the ability to, um, if you have a long list of feature types that people can create, you can just type, tap in a couple of characters um, and get a, get a smaller list. Um, and again, the, the process for collecting is, is much the same. So obviously my GPS is pretty poor. Uh, in here, 260 meters. Hopefully, uh, no one's going to be able to find that. But again, you have the same ability to enter information, uh, pick, use pick lists, etc., um, and submit that. So, just a couple of ways to minimize the amount of uh, data that you're syncing back and forth uh, when you're working offline. Um, that's available now in in Collector and, and ArcGIS Online, as well as Portal. Uh, it's also available. So the, the other thing we wanted to talk about is, as Jeff alluded to, is some of the work that's going to be coming out very soon, in our, and that's really to support high accuracy data collection. So uh, there are a few key points about high accuracy data collection. One of, the, one of them is that we really do um, expect uh, you to use, you know, for high accuracy, you're going to want to use an external GNS or receiver. Um, for many of those cases, you know, you, with a smartphone, you're only going to get down to you know five, ten meters um, accuracy. For many things, that's just not good enough. Um, so, we're working on making uh, this process much easier uh, within Collector to uh, use these external receivers. So, the first thing I need to do uh, here, I have a, a GNS receiver, a Bad Elf uh, surveyor. Uh, we support a wide range of receivers. Uh, from many manufacturers, we've been working with, with them to uh, make sure that you know, the, the most popular ones work uh, quite well with Collector. Uh, the first thing I need to do is I need to pair this device with, uh, with my tablet here. So I'm just going to go through and pair. This is, a, this is through Bluetooth. Uh, so you can see I have a Bad Elf uh, GPS here. I'm going to go ahead and pair that. And this particular device asks for confirmation via code. You guys have a lot of devices. Wow, it's a long list. All right, so there's my, there's my confirmation. So I need to confirm both on the tablet and on the receiver that that, that is the, the device I want to use. Um, and then once this is paired, um, I can come back to Collector, and then I can start setting up uh, my information here for to use this, this receiver instead of the integrated uh, location sensor that, that's in the tablet. So you'll see here that we have what we call a location provider. And right now, it's using the, the integrated one in my, in my Surface Book here. Um, but I can come in and add a receiver. Now, for iOS and Android, we support uh, Bluetooth receivers. We also support uh, serial devices on Windows as well. Um, so you can see that I now have this device that's, that I've paired uh, with my tablet that I can use as a receiver. So I'll go ahead and tap that, and we'll use that, that receiver. And then I can specify an antenna height. So when you're using a, a device, a receiver that might be mounted on a pole, um, you know the height of the pole, if, especially when you're thinking when accuracy really counts, you want to even be able to measure the distance from the top of the pole to the phase center on your receiver so you get an accurate, accurate measurement. In this case, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at zero uh, and add that receiver. Now, at this point, I'm still using my integrated receiver as the source of positions for, for collector. Um, to switch that, I'm just going to select my, my new Bad Elf receiver here and switch that. So once this, once this is done, all of the locations that are going to come in the collector are from this receiver only. So once I've paired this receiver, I'm not going to get any positions coming in from my integrated receiver. I'll, only, I'll, I'll be able to use this exclusively. So uh, the other thing is uh, that we've been working on is the ability to really understand and define how that, the positions that come in to collector 
how they're transformed. So if you're using a, uh, you know, an I, a, a iPad or an iPhone uh, or Android de device, now we're assuming, um, and this is true, that your data from the integrated receiver is coming in on the WGS84 coordinate system. Um, and that's great until you start getting into where you want to use a corrected, uh, corrected source for your positions, um, such as RTK or SBOS. Um, and in that case, you really, if that information is probably not coming in on WGS84. We want you to allow you to specify what that information is coming in on and how to transform that uh, and let you control that process. So I'm just going to go ahead and tap on the location profile here, and I'm going to go ahead and add a new profile. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm saying I need to figure out what the receiver's, uh, the correction service is that I'm using and figure out the coordinate system. So uh, in many cases, like in the U.S., uh, that'll be NAD 83-2011. Uh, and then I need to determine what the coordinate system is of my map. Um, so and that can, of course, be a geographic or a projected coordinate system. Um, this is obviously a extremely long list, um, so I can uh, either type in a couple of, of characters, or I can, if I know the well-known ID of my coordinate system, I can type that in. So I, in this case, my map is in Web Mercator. Um, and then once I do that, I now have the ability to define the area in which I'm going to work. And the reason why this is important is that by doing this, this allows us to give you the best uh, options for datum transformations. So we're going to go in and we're going to say, well, we're working just in the local San Diego area here. And now I've got a list of valid datum transformations that I can use between that correction service coordinate system and my map. Um, and we sort this list by uh, relevance. So the top one here is the most, uh, is the suggested one. So in this case, I'm going to use that. Um, and then finally, I just need to give this a name. And go ahead and add that. And much like we did with the receiver, uh, I need to specify that this is, the, this is the location profile I want to use. And now, once I've done so, every position that comes in from my external receiver, which could be a corrected position, is now going to be uh, assumed to be, in this case, NAT 83-2011 be transformed, and I've now been able to define all of that for collectors, so uh, we want to manage and maintain that highly accurate position that you're getting uh, from those corrected sources. So the last thing I want to point out is that uh, as part of this work, we've also um, made it easier to specify a, your own location accuracy level that you want to use for data collection. Many times you have specific project requirements. Um, we used to have a slider here where we had a series of predefined values. Um, now we allow you to go ahead and enter uh, individual values. Um, we also now allow you to do this in uh, imperial units as well. So you can see now instead of doing it in meters, uh, I can do it in feet and inches. Um, and that will be reflected throughout the application. All right, so let's, uh, let's open a map real quick and uh, take a quick look at a couple of other things here. Now, unfortunately, we're indoors, and I still don't have a fix in here. So this is going to be, we're not going to be able to showcase everything here. But there's a couple of points that I wanted to mention. Um, one is the, uh, we have the, the badge down here on the, on the right -hand, lower right-hand corner of our map. Um, if, and that obviously shows me the, the horizontal accuracy, and, and the red or green tells me whether I'm within or without, outside my accuracy. Um, I also now can get additional information. So if I'm, you know, I'm curious of what, you know, how old is this position? Um, I can see that in this case I've never gotten a position because I've not been able to get a fix since we paired this device. Um, but I also get additional information. I can see, you know, hey, what's my fix type? Am I getting a corrected position or not? Um, you know, am I? How many satellites am I connected to? Why is my why is my accuracy not what I'm expecting? This allows you to sort of diagnose and understand what's going on. Um, with the receiver, am I under, you know, do, do I need to move out under the canopy, whatever the case may be. Uh, the other thing is that the information that you're collecting, when, especially when using one of these receivers, is, is very important. Um, and we now allow you, when you're collecting point features, to uh, 
add that data directly to the point features that you're collecting. So, uh, for example, all of this information here, as well as uh, other information like the p.dot, h.dot, v.dot values, um, uh, could be stored with each point that I collect. So, because I don't have a fix here, I can't I can't demonstrate this, but um, that's just something that, that you can use, and then we track that. So every time you use the GPS uh, to specify a location, we'll update that information. So that'll have be sort of an audit trail, and, and you can really understand what the what was the, the positional quality of that data when it was collected. So another uh, another thing to just be aware of. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jeff. Cool. Yeah, I just want to summarize. Um, we can hit one there. What Doug just showed you, um, and step back first to the sync improvements that we made. Uh, Doug showed you the uh, advanced offline options that are a part of uh, the web map uh, details. And those are supported with the hosted feature services today. But uh, if you want to use them with your own ArcGIS server feature services, um, you're going to need 10.4 or higher. Um, so just be Except aware of that. The, the schema only option actually works with 10.3 and 10.3.1. Well, apparently, the schema-only option works with 10.3 so and what I, what I demonstrated <laughs> is available uh, for 10.3 and 10.3.1. Okay. Um, another thing that's important to note is that you can resize the photos. So if you want to uh, bring the size of those photos down, you can do that um, inside of the settings as well. And um, say you're out in the field, but the map was set up for the bidirectional sync but you're in a low bandwidth connection and you need to just upload. You need to get that data back quickly. You can go into collector settings and turn on the push only setting and that'll just do an upload and it won't do any downloads. So there's a lot of optimizations there to manage this volume of data. I do want to mention also that uh, you should be aware of your, um, your network condi conditions when you're out in the field. Um, so. If you, especially if you're setting up a base camp and you need to work around that base camp, as we've seen with a number of these emergency management use cases, understanding what that um, network uh, upload download speed is really going to be important. Because if you just think about it for a minute, you're uploading and downloading data, and that data can be quite large. You think about the size of photos um, with their default resolution. Uh, a photo could be two to five megabytes in size, or, you know, if Doug or I are out and we're taking panoramas, they can get pretty large. So, and if you're all within connectivity of, say, a MiFi trying to upload and download, well, it only can do so much. Uh, so, really understand the network, the network um, conditions you're in as you're using the collector application. We tr we try to provide you as much meaningful we information we can. Um, back and forth. Uh, the other thing to consider is uh, managing the server and um, and looking at the, at the system logs if you are experiencing any any failures. So you can put the uh, logging in a in a in a debug mode, and, and you'll see the messages coming in uh, when you try to sync. Um, moving over to the slide on uh, location accuracy. This is our 10.4 release. This is our next big release, and we're really close to being done with it. Uh, it's a few weeks away, actually. Um, and the, the, just to recap quickly on the big highlights there, up until now, we've used the internal location service API on your mobile device, and that abstracts out the notion of GPS, right? Because it could be cellular assisted, or it could be GPS. It's always in WGS84. And for a lot of uh, our customers, in fact, I'd like to ask that. How many people have been looking for the high accuracy capabilities to deploy? A number of you. Great. Um, so you, those positions have always been coming to you in WGS84, right? But if you took a Trimble R2 or an EOS unit uh, and you used RTK, you could get corrected positions coming through Bluetooth to your device and right into the uh, location provider that's in, embedded in your um, iPhone or your Android device. But it was all lost because as soon as you drop that point, it would shift it because we didn't support um, the ability to have a location profile and set up that datum transformation, right? Which is really critical to do any, any high accuracy data collection. Um, as Doug showed you, uh, we can display and filter the, um, the accuracy from that receiver. 
One of the other things we didn't mention that we've done is, um, and this is helpful even without high accuracy data collection capabilities, but we tied it to this release, is when you download that map, you know, you're setting an extent and a number of scales for the base map. Uh, and quite often that can be difficult to get the extent and area that you need um, uh, to go out and do field data collection with. Um, but you have reference layers in your map that are vector based that provide additional context. But what we've done in the past is we've said, okay, well, we'll only let you zoom to the scale of the base map that you took offline. Now we're going to let you over zoom. So you can go as deep as you want. It'll pixelate uh, on the map, but if you have your own vector layers, then you're going to see that crispness. And that's really important when you're looking at a GNSS accuracy between, um, you know, subfoot uh, on features. So this is another feature that we added in to this release. And likewise, we attach the GNSS uh, metadata directly to your feature. What we don't support yet within Collector, because we're, that's coming underneath us later this year, is the uh, ability to model uh, Z values on a geometry, right? So to do elevation today, what we're saying you can do, and we can do this through some scripts we provide, or um, you can add these fields onto your feature classes, is uh, we can store the height. Um, we can store the, uh, um, and it's the height above ellipsoid that we're, that we're actually storing there. Uh, and uh, then you can transform that uh, yourself when you're back in the office. We're providing a script that helps you do that as well. Um, the other f uh, metadata is uh, things like the fixed type. So are you RTK fixed or float? Um, what's the number of satellites? What's the fixed time uh, when, the, when the position was, was created? Um, and it's off of point features only right now. Um, until we can actually get those Z value support in the geometry from our run times, we won't support the Z values or, uh, on, uh, on lines or polygons, as I mentioned. Um, anything else to mention there, Doug, since we're, this is really wrapping it up. I think the one other thing uh, to say is that um, with the photo attachments, one of the things that we fixed was that um, we were uh, basically losing the EXIF information out of the header of the photo. And that was a concern for a lot of people that want to pull those uh, photos out. They wanted the direction information. Uh, they wanted the lat long information. We're now storing that uh, in the photo starting with this release. Anything else we want to talk about this coming release? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so uh, last thing to mention, uh, you know, we're going to have a, a tech workshop uh, that's completely dedicated to high accuracy, and that's going to happen tomorrow. So if you want to deep dive into this with us, uh, that's going to be tomorrow morning. Uh, today at noon, if you're looking for a free lunch, we have a mobile special interest group meeting in room three. Uh, so come join us there. Obviously, you're here for the first one. I could have taken that off the slide. Uh, and then our dev team is here. So if you want to talk to um, the folks that are building Collector, they're down in the exhibit area. And come to the Apps Island and talk to us. Uh, because they're just, we don't let them out of the office very often, <laughs> other than to test outside when it's 100 degrees. So um, they're real happy to be in the air conditioning and come and talk to you guys. So uh, take advantage of that and go meet the team and, uh, and, and ask some questions. They might be a little bit timid and scared, but they're good people. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, the surveys are all online now, so um, uh, please fill it out in the events app uh, and uh, let us know about how crappy this room is, but how great the presenters are, right? Um, and with that, I thank you for coming, but uh, I'd like to take, so I think we have some time for questions, right? How much time do we have left? We got five minutes left. Does any anyone have any questions? In the back here, yeah. Yes. A, a lot of the work that was done here was done on the individual devices that you're going to take out into the field. Is there a way to capture that as a profile and transfer it from one device? Ah, uh, you know, there was one thing I wanted to mention that I forgot to mention is. Uh, some of those settings that, um, that you set up, like let's say, for instance, the, the location uh, provider and the location profile that Doug just showed, um, that's stored as settings on the device itself, but independent of, web, of the web map, because you might have multiple web maps. 
this is a first iteration of that for us. We want to bring those settings up into your organization and be able to attach them not to a map, but to uh, basically your identity, right? And you'd be able to share that across your identity. So I could create um, a location profile for Doug potentially, and then when uh, Doug uh, goes out to do data collection work, with his identity uh, signed into the collector application, that profile is available. So this is a first step towards doing that. But we have to, it's coming, we have to change ArcGIS Online to make that happen, yeah. Anything, yes? Ah, that's a good question. So um, you saw that there's datum transformations inside of collector now. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, uh, there's datum transformations available inside of Collector now. Is that the same spatial reference library that's inside of desktop? And it really is, um, with some caveats. Um, we, we are actually taking our projection library and we compile it for our runtimes as well as our desktops now. But what's not there, and we didn't mention that, is uh, grid-based projections or custom projections. Oh, sorry, tra transformations, yeah. So those are, they can be quite large and we're thinking about how you could potentially sideload those uh, to the device. So that's the only caveat, but it is exactly the same transformations that you have inside of um, the desktop today because yeah. it's the same underlying engine. Yeah, it is, you know, outside of the grid-based grid, grid -based transformations, there are a, a sub, it is a subset, but it's a pretty big subset big of, of the available projections. Not yet. There's no possibility of custom yet. Yes. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Actually, I don't know if you're busy tomorrow, but if you can come to that session, uh, we'll I think you're going to cover that because there's ways that you there can are, think about are. the data frame and and how you can do that transformation as the data gets stored back in, right? Where do all the potential transformations happen as you're starting with the map that you author to publish to consume from the receiver? There's at least three potential three. transformations there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Tutorials. So there are. So that if you go to our doc, uh, our documentation pages, we do have tutorials uh, for the basic workflows. We don't at this point have any tutorials for the high accuracy stuff available yet. Um, we do have. If you guys are interested, we do have our beta program. It is open, and we have a bunch of documentation there, uh, along with videos showing how to That's go true. through the workflows. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. One more question. Oh, sorry. Does that also, the documentation include uh, how to change the forms? Change the form. So the question yeah. was, does the documentation include the way to, to change the forms? So we, we do talk a little bit about how do you configure the pop-up, which essentially results in the form. Yeah. yeah. So there is some there. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your conference.